little feedback. All right. Firemen, astronauts, doctors, policemen. What do all of these people have in common? Maybe when you were in elementary school, you envisioned yourself fulfilling one of these impactful roles. That's the key here. We might have seen ourselves in these roles because we knew we'd make such a visible difference in the lives of others. And without a doubt, you certainly can in these jobs. But they also have something else in common, something that underlies far more of the recent changes we've undergone as a civilization. The common link is the benefit they all experience from advancements in technology. Now this seems pretty obvious, because we ourselves benefit from new gadgets all the time. But let's step back here for a moment. Technology impacts all of us, firemen, astronauts, doctors, policemen, and of course, the boring jobs everyone else has. If our goal is to make a difference in the lives of others, it's a great place to start by helping those who do just that. Imagine if we had people who could take powerful scientific principles, design practical systems with a careful analysis of resources, and ensure their reliable operation. It's like a whole new outlet for creativity. You could see the difference you're making in your own hands and know that you were part of the development process. You could quantitatively measure how much of a difference you've made and rest with confidence that you're doing your part. But you could also just visit the people who use your technology to get a qualitative feel for your impact. There's a word for people like this. They're called engineers. But it's a word that isn't well understood by so many who should understand it. Although we still have plenty of time to make up our minds, our interests in education are already being focused by the middle school age. At this point, we have a basic exposure to some physical sciences, liberal arts, math, and everything else. But we're still pretty optimistic. But for a lot of hands-on, creatively-minded students, the pieces should fit together at this point. But most kids just don't know the word, or if they do, it's probably not the right definition. Engineering is just as legitimate a pursuit as being a scientist, doctor, policeman, or astronaut. But it certainly isn't taught that way in most places. Maybe people think that it's too professional a discipline to be taught so early, or that there's really nothing to say about it until you get a job. As though teaching it would somehow deprive students of all their interests in interdisciplinary and worldly thought. That engineering is somehow incompatible with the genuine aspiration to change things for the better. I don't buy that one bit. Engineering is more than that. It's a mindset. It's also a methodology. And most importantly, it's a statement to the world that says, I believe I can make this idea change people's lives. I know this because I've done the math, I know the theory, and I have the willpower to realize it. When you set your goal as becoming an engineer, you accept the relevance of scientific knowledge, the incremental value of work, the importance of planning, and the responsibility you will someday carry. It is truly complementary to so much that you already learn in general education. So you tell me why this simple, powerful concept isn't worthy of teaching to children. But I'm not here to make a complaint against our education system, or even to propose an overhaul of some sort. My team and I, we're here to solve problems, just like IIT taught us. We are IMI, Intuitive Modules in Engineering Education. Our mission is simple. We aim to deliver compact, memorable lessons to educate children on the discipline of engineering and to encourage them to consider it as a career path. So before we get into this, let's first figure out what we're actually teaching. What is engineering? Oh, look at this. A creative application of scientific principles to design or develop structures, machines, apparatus. We can break it down into a few really important things. Engineers draw from a vast body of published, well understood scientific principles and find unique applications and concepts for them. In any real system, we have to deal with limited resources in every direction. We can't just keep expanding on one side. So we have to deal with trade offs to efficiently use this system as best we can. We also have to make sure that our system works as it's expected under all operating conditions, so that it's safe for everyone. To do this, we have to test it appropriately in a controlled environment. Finally, we have to do a lot of modeling. In engineering, you try to design a simple system, but if you can't do that, you have to model it to the point where it is both simple and elegant. So now we'll get into the approach we took in designing this workshop and this engineering experience that we're going to talk about. We set out some major objectives. High-level concepts. We're only going to focus on the things that are truly 
inherent to all forms of engineering that don't depend on technology or change. These are things that will always be there. We want to make it portable so that we can bring this any school, so that we're not limited in where we can really bring this information and help others. It should also fit in a car. Low overhead. Now, to make this impact as many people as possible, like I've said, we can't make it cost a lot per workshop. It has to have low maintenance costs and low planning complexity and overhead. Finally, the hardest one. This is really what sets us apart, in my opinion. The entire thing will go in an hour and a half. This truly differentiates us from many, many engineering experiences. But we have to be careful of some pitfalls that we might encounter in the design of an engineering workshop. One is lecturing. I mean, lecturing about engineering? That's like making a manual about laser tag and saying, here, kids, read this. It's just as much fun as the real thing. <laughs> I mean, for effect, I'm just going to do this a couple times. All right, you guys get it. We also have to be careful of using repetitive, laborious hand calculations. Now, I'm not going to say they don't exist in engineering at all, but I don't think it's a very good learning tool. And as Stephen Wolfram noted in his famous TED Talk, they're often misused. We can get a lot of intuitive feel for a large system simply by looking at graphs, simulations, and other live experiences, animations, that really show us the visual relationships between very complex variables. And this can do a whole lot more than wasting their time with pencil and paper. Now, writing is important to convey your thoughts, but our workshop mostly focuses on a dialogue between students. And finally, the unbounded problem. To have a real engineering experience, like I said before, we have to make sure the resources are limited. There's a clear methodology for approaching the problem. And finally, the stuff that we actually want in our workshop. So this first one is excitement. This is extremely important. What we're really going for is the first time that kids truly understand the essence of engineering. And we probably want to leave a good impression, like it's fun, memorable, interesting. So we're going to do our best to do that. Hands-on stuff is really important. This can do a few important things in addition to keeping them excited. It gives them ownership over their solution, and it really helps them understand what's going on. As our title suggests, the intuitive problem-solving approach is an important part of how we design this workshop. And in the real world, it turns out that intuition is really important for engineers. So we want to keep this a part of our whole system. And finally, curiosity. So if at the end of a workshop, a kid comes up to me and is like, you know what, Jeff? That was a really great workshop, and I feel like I understand everything. You know, you really nailed it, and I, I actually understand engineering now. So I think I'm pretty content with what I learned. That's bad. We don't want that. <laughs> See, we already know that. We know in the back of our heads that in an hour and a half, it's just not going to get everything across. And we're not trying to do that. We want them to leave this workshop and be unsatisfied with what they learned. They should be asking questions and looking for more and more resources. To stave them off, we have some supplementary resources to feed to the teachers for a little while after we leave, but that won't do all of it. So now I'll get into what we've actually done for our solution. So as you can see here, what we have is a robot obstacle course, which is sometimes in other workshops. But we do it a little differently. You can see this robot following the line here. The floor of the course is actually covered in something called dry erase paint. You might have used this for different things. I think it's awesome. And I think this is a really, really, really cool application. Because this saves us the difficulty of having to have kids fight over remote control and flying robots, which aren't supposed to do that, and all sorts of other things that we would really like to avoid. So it's very convenient. You can just erase it, draw a new one, and the robot follows a completely different path. This is a picture of the course in a little more detail. You can see a few different challenges and some teams tackling it, drawing out different courses, and trying different things. And this is the fleet of LV9001 learning vehicles that we call them. <laughs> They're pretty awesome. They can be recharged very conveniently. They're actually a modified version. Um, some of you hackers, electronics guys may know of the Ardubot, which was created by Sparkfin Electronics, which is one of our sponsors. Uh, basically, they employ the Arduino uh, ro robotics and ro like a prototyping platform for this purpose. So we have this full robot and this course and everything, and it's great. And you might ask, so where's the engineering? Now, the robot's done. It's like, oh, it's ready to go. Not exactly true. And there are a few different directions we could have gone in making this whole experience. Build a robot? This is pretty common I see in some engineering workshops where you build a robot from the ground up and it's great, except that it takes forever 
you have to learn a lot of unnecessary technical details, which are important later, but learning about a drivetrain when you're just trying to understand the basics of engineering is a waste of time, in my opinion. Or we could have them program the robot if they understand control flow and syntax, and even if we have this beautiful interface which removes all of those, we still miss out on the whole, you know, applying scientific principles thing, which is kind of important. Our solution is called synthetic parameters. Now we've come up with a very convenient way to introduce physical impacts on the performance of the robots through only digital modifications. To start, they can play around with these three things, fuel, agility, and power. These are reprogrammed on the fly. You can visualize any given solution as a triangle, the distance to each vertex being the amount of resources allocated to that different parameter. And you can do different things with it. That's not the only thing that they can change. They can also change the light threshold, the strength of the reaction when it encounters a line. And also, just how they draw the line can radically change it. Now, the solution of the triangle in here is pretty bad given the low agility and the high light threshold. The thickness of the line also affects it. You can see in this one, the solution's better. It has a low light threshold, so it'll pick up on the sharp turns. It has higher agility so that it can follow it better. To keep kids interested, and this is one of the hardest things in any workshop, I don't care what it is, is just keeping them looking at what you're doing and engaged. So to do this, we gave them roles that simulate real contextual jobs. The systems engineer is responsible for allocating the resources between fuel, agility, power, and making common ground for the other engineers. The civil engineer maps out the area. He surveys it and tries to use it most efficiently and links it to the robot's capabilities. The test engineer is responsible for documenting the data and converting each iteration into a useful improvement to your design. The calibration engineer is there to save the day when you're out of money, but you need just a little bit more performance. He can change the light threshold and the timing of boosts and breaks to ensure your robot performs exactly as you want it. And although he objects to this, the technology officer, Robert Morrison, made this obviously a function over form prototype for our interface, which I think is awesome, so I'm going to show it anyway. Um, what you can do here is pretty simple. You can play around with the money, and you can allocate it there. You can also do boost timing, light threshold, and other fun things. So we don't need to look at that. And this is just a video of one of our students kind of working with that interface. It's uh, plugged into the USB, you can see. And he's just, he's at the point where he's out of money, so he's trying to determine how he should really spend his resources and make a better solution. So now we're going to get into the process that they go through. First, in engineering, you always have to understand the problem. You know, survey the area. If you're given a big budget, understand why. Maybe there are some challenges that you didn't notice. Next, you have to map the requirements of the problem to the solution. In this program, or in this uh, picture, they're looking at the laptop and plugging in their next solution to the robot. Next, you have to test your solution and record the results. A few teams are trying out a few different paths in this picture. And then finally, you use those results and you apply it in a feedback loop to iterate your design. Actually, what we found is giving confidence that when you recorded your data, it was much more useful and they got through it much faster. So we'll work through an example problem that they might go through. This is obstacle one called clear the way. And I don't know about you, but this looks pretty clear. So we'll work through that. The goal is to get from A to B. So we're just going to draw this nice little line and everything will be great. Now, it obviously won't be great because I just said that. This is what happens. Some gray shapes happen to get in the way. And what happens really is a freeway actually collapses overhead, leaving conveniently movable rubble on top of their line wherever they draw it. The trick is that you can't get to the other side while dragging the rubble with you. You have to plow it out of the way and get rid of it before crossing over. So we'll throw out a curveball, add a couple curves, and we'll be great. But it won't be great because I said that the infamous double rubble. With twice the wreckage, your robot will be less than half as good. So if we're not thinking about this in an engineering context, we might just say, well, add more curves, use more area. But that's not engineering. There's no ingenuity in that. It's not efficient and it's not good. And if the kids do something like this, we encourage them to say, can you do it better? This is what you'd kind of do. And it looks messy and I don't like it. If you're really efficient, you understand how the robot works. You know that it can cross an intersection without accidentally getting confused as to go left or right. If you use the same space twice, you're much more efficient, and the solution really works. 
So that's a whole lot to learn in an hour and a half, you know, but we break it down into a few important themes. Trade-offs, reliability, efficiency, the process, and most importantly, the teamwork element. Now, IMI is, uh, we're, we have a bunch more workshops to do this semester at different schools. We're super excited to be doing it. But we also have growth on our mind as a, like a primary goal, I would say. We're looking to expand our network of volunteers by reaching out to some nearby universities. And we're making new contacts with the Chicago Public Schools District every day. We're looking for additional sponsors to support us in this expansion effort so that we can replicate our equipment and bring this experience to more and more schools that are in need. The impetus of this effort is a simple but powerful idea that engineering as a mindset, a methodology, and a process is more than just a career path. It is a transformative outlet for creativity, a dynamic challenge, and a way to truly link your work to your impact in life. Children deserve to understand and experience this. Amy will be here to inspire the next generation of engineers, but it will be up to you, educators, mentors, parents, and friends, to help them along the way. Thank you. <laughs>